So, yes. So, uh, I'll begin with uh, setting up the mathematical framework for uh, classical optical, quantum limited classical optical communications and talk about this performance gap that exists between pulse by pulse detection versus joint detection. Uh, and then uh, I'll introduce uh, belief propagation with quantum messages, which is the, the quantum algorithm that forms the workhorse behind uh, our design of a structured receiver for this uh, task. Uh, and uh, I'll present results based on such a joint detection receiver for an exemplary five-bit uh, linear tree code. And I will also briefly present uh, results from a trap down implementation of this receiver. Uh, and I'll conclude with uh, a summary and outlook. Okay, so optical communications is uh, really as old as uh, human civilizations. Uh, people have communicated using visual signals such as uh, smoke and beacon fires since uh, ages. And in the modern day, uh, uh, the internet backbone is supported by fiber optic communications. And in the future, uh, space-based communications are going to be uh, heavily reliant on uh, free space optical communications because they can give you uh, high data rates uh, at while requiring you know equipment with uh, low size and weight and power requirements, which is really key uh, when it comes to you know deploying these uh, communication systems on space borne uh, vehicles and satellites. And uh, any optical communication system. Uh, consists of a, I mean, just like any other communication system would, it consists of a transmitter, a channel and a receiver. Sorry, I, I, I forgot to show these pictures. And uh, yeah, an optical uh, transmitter would typically consist of a pulsed laser source and a modulator uh, that would encode your data stream, from the bits from the data stream onto these pulses, either in the amplitude or the phase of the, the the, the pulses. And then your channel is either an optical fiber or a free space link. And your receiver is an optical receiver that is typically uh, consists of some uh, linear optical elements like beam splitters and phase shifters, perhaps a local oscillator, uh, followed by uh, you know, photo detectors. And in this uh, work, we are what we are proposing is to have a quantum processor uh, uh, perform uh, a, a joint quantum processing before you apply a conventional optical receiver. Okay, so that's an introduction to uh, optical communications. Now, uh, let's look at the mathematical uh, description of uh, these laser pulses, both classically and quantumly. So uh, a laser light pulse, a quasi-monochromatic laser light pulse, that is a pulse with a well-defined uh, central frequency uh, and a very narrow bandwidth, at which the carrier wave oscillates is described uh, completely classically uh, by a complex number alpha, uh, whose amplitude is uh, uh, a function of the, the mean photon number in the pulse, which is uh, essentially a function of the, the average energy in the pulse, and uh, a phase phi, which is the, the carrier phase. And uh, quantum mechanically, we know that uh, a laser light pulse can be described by the so-called coherent state of the optical mode that is defined by the shape of the pulse in space and time. And as we know, the coherent state is a, uh, an indefinite uh, uh, coherent superposition of uh, the photon number states with a, a, with a probability statistic that is Poisson distributed. And uh, how is information encoded in these laser pulses? Well, there is there is a variety of ways you can encode classical information in an optical pulse, uh, either you know uh, over its amplitude or the phase or a combination of both. Now, a widely used uh, uh, modulation format in communications is uh, the so-called binary phase shift key, which is where you encode a bit a zero or a one value in the phase of your laser light pulse. So you have an amplitude fixed to alpha, and your zero or one is just encoded by uh, the phase of this uh, pulse as uh, plus or minus. Now, uh, these two coherent states, plus alpha and minus alpha, 
are in general not orthogonal. Uh, this is because uh, if you look at the overlap of these two coherent states, it's a function of the mean photon number. It, the overlap drops exponentially as a function of the mean photon number. So when when you have bright bright pulses with a lot of photons in it, they're essentially you know the overlap is essentially zero, and hence you have classical. Uh, that's the classical limit. But when you have very few photons, uh, there is a significant overlap, and hence it becomes fundamentally impossible to discriminate these states uh, error-free in an error-free manner. And now. Uh, how is a photon loss channel modeled? Well, uh, very simply, it can be modeled as an attenuation of the, uh, the, the complex field amplitude of your laser pulse by, an by a transmissivity factor eta, square root of eta here, where eta is a number between zero and one. And so when you have attenuation on your BTSK uh, states, uh, these states now become, you know, coherent states that are even more overlapping and hence more uh, indistinguishable. Okay, and now uh, it becomes convenient to think of, uh, to represent the BPSK coherent states as qubit states. Now this is possible because even though your coherent states are actually, uh, you know, pure states, pure state vectors that live in this infinite dimensional Hilbert space of a single mode of the electromagnetic field, uh, the fact that we are interested in just discriminate, I mean, we are dealing with just two states uh, and the problem of uh, interest here is discriminating two states. Uh, we are essentially working in a two dimensional subspace. And so you can represent these states effectively uh, as states of a qubit. And uh, so uh, the only constraint that one has to bear in mind is that uh, the representation should be such that the overlap between the two qubit states corresponding to the two coherent states uh, has to be preserved. So if you had, if you start with an overlap e to the minus two eta n, that has to be preserved uh, as the overlap between the two qubit states. And so this is a representation that we will use. And uh, uh, finally, uh, it, is, it is useful to think of this uh, abstract uh, channel model of uh, a classical input and a quantum pure state output. That is, that's the model between the, the classical information that is transmitted and the quantum state that is received at the receiver. So if your classical bit is X denoted by X, then uh, the, the quantum state received at the receiver is this uh, qubit state, which is either a plus or a minus of theta, where theta is the, the channel parameter that tells you how much loss is in the uh, transmissive in the transmission or uh, equivalently what is the angle between these qubit states okay so we will use this uh, classical quantum pure state channel model in the rest of the talk uh, any questions uh, so far on the mathematical model please please feel free to uh, interrupt and uh, any comments or any questions please and uh, so if you look at symbol by symbol detection of this classical quantum channel, uh, so the information about the classical bit is encoded in the classical, in this quantum state uh, here. Uh, and so if you, were, if you have to extract that, if you wanna extract that information, you have to perform a measurement. And so a measurement would map that quantum state onto a classical uh, random variable again. And uh, because Error free, uh, discriminate, error free detection is you know, fundamentally impossible. You will induce uh, errors in uh, identifying X. So uh, what you in most generally uh, uh, in, end up inducing is a, is a conditional probability distribution uh, uh, where you do have probabilities of misidentifying X. Uh, and so what is induced is uh, what information theorists, uh, classical information theorists call the binary symmetric channel, where the, the crossover probabilities of uh, misidentification uh, between X and Y uh, are, are given by, are symmetric, first of all, and if you call that P, then this is the, the trans transition probability matrix. And uh, so uh, among all possible measurements that one could perform for uh, this symbol by symbol detection, it turns out that, uh, one can, I mean, it is best to perform the quantum optimal Hellstrom measurement, which is given by this uh, uh, measurement operator here, that 
induces the, the best binary symmetric channel, meaning with the channel with the least crossover probability, which is the minimum average error probability of discriminating these uh, two coherent states uh, for the BPSK alphabet. And the, the corresponding, uh, so once you have this binary symmetric channel uh, as your Shannon channel, then Shannon's information theory results tell us, the channel coding theorem tells us that uh, by using uh, an, an asymptotically large number of uh, channels, copies of the channel, uh, and performing coding over these channels, one can attain a rate uh, per use of the channel that's given by uh, the, the maximization of the mutual information of this uh, transition probability that we call the capacity, maximization over the priors at the receiver, at the transmitter. And so the capacity for the binary symmetric channel is given by the one minus binary entropy of this crossover probability. And so this is the best capacity that you can get with uh, symbol by symbol detection for the binary for the binary phase shift key transmission. But now on the other hand, if one were to perform uh, a collective quantum domain processing over several of these, several of these classical quantum pure state channels prior to uh, you know, symbol by symbol detection, then uh, it is uh, known in Shannon theory uh, from this, uh, you know, uh, seminal result of uh, Holevo, Schumacher, and Westmoreland that there is uh, in the, at the asymptotic limit of, you know, a, a, a infinite number of uh, uh, these channel users that are collectively per measured using a joint detection, uh, such a pre, uh, uh, pre-detection followed by, sorry, pre-detection processing followed by individual detection that we together call joint detection. Uh, you can get to this quantity known as the Holevo capacity that's given by the, the von Neumann entropy of the average uh, quantum state at the receiver. And uh, in the limit of small theta, which amounts to uh, like a very small photon number, like vanishing photon number, uh, this gap between the Holevo capacity and the, the symbol by symbol detection capacity, it blows up. So if, in fact, if you look at the plots, uh, the ratio between C infinity and C1, uh, as uh, the overlap parameter goes to one, uh, goes to infinity. So there is an infinite gap here as uh, the overlap approaches one. And so uh, there is a huge uh, benefit to be gained by, by uh, performing joint detection receiver uh, by, by performing joint detection at the receiver in this quantum limited regime of uh, classical optical communications. And uh, uh, Mark and uh, Saikath, uh, they gave uh, a constructive protocol, uh, a coding scheme uh, by generalizing the, the classical polar coding uh, approach for such classical quantum channels. And uh, these codes, in principle, can attain this Holevo capacity asymptotically. Uh, and their uh, classical quantum polar codes, uh, they require a successive quantum successive cancellation decoder in order to tell apart these code words. Uh, and this is a conceptual decoder that uh, basically de de deciphers one bit at a time, uh, but there is no structured uh, optical design to uh, realize this receiver uh, uh, that is so that still remains an open problem. And uh, in this regard, uh, there has been a question recently, which is uh, if a quantum generalization of, a, of an algorithm like the belief propagation algorithm, which is known to be near optimal for decoding a large class of uh, classical codes, can be used to design an optimal decoder for the classical quantum channel codes. Uh, Yes, Mark. All right, I just thought to interrupt. I think what you said when you were speaking is, is accurate, but I think what's written on your slide, the middle point is a little misleading. Um, it's just that it's not known. You know, no, no one has given a recipe for, the, for an efficient implementation of the quantum can, uh, successive cancellation decoder. Mm. I consider that a very important open problem, you know, so. Um, you, you wrote that it's infeasible. Sorry, I, yeah, actually, I, I spoke something else and I wrote something else. Yeah. Sorry for that. Yeah. So it's just, I, I consider it a very beautiful and interesting open question, you know. 
right. yeah sorry about that i i this is an old slide i i forgot to change this yeah right. uh, so yeah it, it it is we don't know of a structured optical design to implement the quantum successive cancellation decoder and uh, what we now have is this uh, potential approach based on quantum belief propagation that could uh, be able to implement this uh, and so that takes us to the the next topic which is belief propagation and let me see uh, i think i'm at about half an hour point right mark uh, can i yeah you're fine i mean um maybe honestly, about... i think you can take as much time as you want and people will just um, log off as they please oh, i i <laughs> I'll keep it within the next 25 minutes or so yeah. okay yeah i think you're on track don't, don't worry okay. about that thank you yeah so then uh, so what is so so let's first uh, introduce belief propagation as a concept so uh, classical belief propagation algorithm is a message passing algorithm that is that can solve problems that are defined on a graph and it works by passing uh, probabilities between nodes on the graph and uh, 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 the, the beliefs uh, can be used to efficiently compute uh, posterior marginal distributions in uh, statistical inference problems for example uh, decoding uh, classical linear codes and uh, uh, in in a recent development uh, joe renes at eth zurich uh, introduced a quantum generalization sorry about yeah this is the reference uh, a quantum generalization of this belief propagation algorithm uh, it is uh, what we would i mean we would like to call this belief propagation with quantum messages or bpqm and not quantum belief propagation because people in the quantum uh, community have been referring to quantum belief I mean something else as quantum belief propagation so this is belief propagation with quantum messages where these uh, instead of passing probabilities we can have we have an algorithm uh, from joe uh, which passes quantum states between uh, nodes on the abstract graph uh, that your problem is defined on and this can potentially help decode binary linear codes on pure state classical quantum channels which is our task and uh, our contribution here is that uh, we use this bpqm algorithm to present an explicit uh, structured uh, uh, design of a circuit uh, for a joint detection receiver for a particular example code a uh, exemplary 5 bit code and uh, yeah i'll i'll show that uh, in a minute and uh, we show that uh, this receiver can attain the quantum optimal uh, minimum average error probability of discriminating the code words of this example code and also uh, uh, show what is known as super additive capacity which i will talk about briefly okay so uh, before we go on to talk about belief quantum the, the belief propagation with quantum messages let's uh, discuss Uh, let's look at classical belief propagation uh, exactly and uh, so uh, most of you might be familiar with uh, classical uh, binary linear codes so a binary linear code is defined by uh, what's called its parity check matrix and so uh, uh, if when you're given a parity check matrix uh, the code words are essentially the elements of the null space of the the matrix in the binary vector space so uh, every code word is orthogonal to every row of uh, such a parity check matrix when the parity check matrix has these dimensions n minus k cross n uh, you basically have k message bits that are encoded in n uh, uh, you know data bits and uh, d is the the minimum hamming weight of the code words which is related to the number of uh, errors that you can correct using the code and in this uh, uh talk the example code that we will be using is this 5322 uh, linear code which has a tree structure now uh we can we can represent a linear code uh, you know efficiently using this factor graph representation where uh so if so this 532 code has this parity check matrix and it has uh, eight code words and uh, each code word uh, will satisfy these two linear uh, you know modulo 2 some conditions uh, uh, 
So basically, you can read out the first row here as x1 plus x2 plus x3 should be zero, which can be graphically represented as x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals zero as represented by this check node C1. Likewise, the second row is the check node C2 and x1 plus x4 plus x5 has to be zero. And uh, you, will, you can see that these are the eight code words that satisfy both of these parity check conditions, if you check. And uh, so in a uh, communication scenario, if you pick code words from this code and transmit them through uh, a physical channel, which is uh, which in a Shannon uh, theoretic model could be uh, represented by these prob uh, transition probabilities, then you would basically be uh, witnessing or like you know receiving information about these pulse bits x1 through x5 through these channels, and so uh, I. Uh, the decoding problem is given a set of measurement outcomes or channel observations at the output of the channel. Uh, let's call that Y. Uh, optimally estimate which code word uh, X was sent. Okay, so if you call these outputs of the channel as Y1 through Y5, estimate uh, optimally what was the uh, X that was sent. And uh, so the the, the the typical the Bayesian approach to this problem is what we call uh, block maximum a posterior probability decoding. And this simply involves uh, computing the posterior probabilities for all possible uh, transmitted code words given your received uh, or like measurement uh, outcomes and uh, picking the code word with the maximum a posterior probability. So you can, uh, this is the, the typical Bayesian approach, but uh, and this is uh, optimal, but one issue is that the complexity of uh, performing this decoder is exponential in the number of uh, bits that are encoded. Because you have to compute all the posteriors, uh, posteriors for all the possible transmitted cube, uh, uh, code words before you can uh, find out which was the, more, uh, the highest one, right? Okay, and uh, on the other hand, one can perform what is known as bitwise maximum a posterior probability decoding, which is uh, you look at uh, you basically look at marginalizing uh, the joint posterior and uh, picking the uh, basically doing maximum a posterior probability for each bit uh, at a time, and uh, for such a code with a linear tree uh, tree factor graph, uh, you can. Uh, the, the the marginal the marginalization can be done in uh, in an efficient way, uh, and that is exactly what your belief propagation algorithm does. And uh, so so here, for example, if you're if you're decoding the value of x one, uh, your your fact these factors are carrying beliefs about what is the more like the, the likely value of x one. And by combining the beliefs from these check nodes C1 and C2, and also from the, the channel uh, W1 itself, which are these three factors, uh, you can you know, accumulate the, the total, the, the, the total pro, uh, belief about what the more likely value of X1 is, and just pick the, the more likely value based on whichever is the high, which, which of the two values has the higher uh, marginal posterior. And so uh, this is bitwise maximum a posterior probability. And for uh, a tree factor graph, uh, this can be computed efficiently. And uh, there is also a lot of uh, uh, possibility to uh, reuse these messages in uh, these beliefs in uh, inferring the values of the other bits as well. So it is very efficient. And so BP does bitwise map efficiently and exactly on uh, Three graphs, and now, uh, now let's bridge over to the quantum generalization that uh, uh, Joe Rennes proposed. So th that is based on this one observation, which is that if you look at uh, at each at any variable node, uh, which let's call it x, and let's say it is connected to check nodes c1 and c2, then uh, all other variable nodes that are connected to these uh, com these check nodes C1 and C2 are actually like independent observations of X through an abstract channel. That is uh, due to the fact that they have to together satisfy these uh, parity check conditions. 
uh, and you can basically uh, write down an induced uh, uh, abstract channel uh, that is like a convolution, channel convolution, which is the total channel between uh, X and the other observations, uh, basically the other variables that, that have memberships in these uh, check conditions that are that have uh, that that have to satisfy these check conditions along with x and likewise at each check node uh, if you have like a variable x that is participating in a check node c and you have say two other check nodes uh, two other variable nodes u and v uh, whose observations through the channel are y and z then due to the fact that x plus u plus v has to be zero we can uh, write down an abstract channel between X and Y and Z, which is that if uh, if V is zero, then X has U has to be X, and if V is one, U has to be uh, U has to be X plus one. So if V is zero, uh, U has U has to be X, and if uh, V is one, U has to be X plus one. And so this is another uh, effective convolution channel between. Uh, X and uh, the other observations, Y and Z. And so using these uh, definitions of uh, uh, variable and check node convolutions, uh, uh, this is where Joe Renner's uh, quantum generalized it. And by replacing these conditional probabilities with uh, quantum density operators, we can infer, we can interpret a received uh, unknown code word as basically a, a uh, a density operator that has this uh, uh, that that has an underlying structure that reflects these uh, these convolutions, channel convolutions, and uh, he also pinned down Renner's in his paper also pinned down the operations that need to be performed at these uh, variable and check nodes in order to combine these uh, these uh, the the different beliefs, the quantum states, uh, and so at a variable node. One has to perform a, a rotated C naught gate to uh, basically accumulate all the information about uh, the the qubit, the, the bit that you are trying to uh, infer, into one of the the two qubits. Yeah, but by the way, these are all uh, uh, before we measure; they are still qubits. Right? We have we have until we perform a classical uh, a measurement quantum measurement; they are still qubits, and so we are we have. Uh, Joseph Renes he pre prescribed these uh, measurements, these these operations that will uh, accumulate these quantum beliefs in a truly quantum manner. Uh, and at the variable nodes, you need these uh, rotated C naught. Uh, this your rotated C naught gate that I'm not showing here. It's a, a form, but it is a rotated version of the C naught gate. And at the check nodes, you just have a C naught gate. And uh, the output is like a classical bit, uh, what we call a classical quantum uh, 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 state, where one of the qubits is rendered a classical bit and the other is a conditional quantum bit. And so we, uh, so if we have we had apply this quantum uh, belief propagation for this uh, 532 code, uh, what that would mean is uh, instead of performing uh, symbol wise measurements to to get classical bit values y1 through y5 we retain the uh, the channel observations as qubit states and because of the knowledge of this uh, the code we know uh, the structure of the unknown i mean the unknown uh, five bit uh, the five qubit uh, density operator has a structure due to the knowledge of uh, the code and uh, we can uh, apply these Belief combining operations at the check nodes and the receiver node and the uh, uh, bit nodes to uh, to to max it, to optimally infer the values of these bit node bits, mm -hmm. and so uh, so here if we are first uh, so I'm showing here the belief propagation with quantum messages circuit to infer the value of the first bit, and so it involves combining. Uh, uh, I mean, using a C naught gate between qubits two and three, that is basically combining their beliefs at this uh, check node and likewise at uh, C2 for qubits four and five. And then uh, there is a, this U, uh, which is the compression uh, unitary that 
combines the beliefs of uh, this uh, the, the message from c1 to x and uh, and from c2 to, to x and then thirdly another uh, variable node uh, unitary that combines this accumulated belief with the belief from the channel w1 and so and then you finally measure uh, the first qubit uh, using the quantum optimal single uh, symbol hellstrom measurement to get the the estimate of that bit value and then uh, the rest of the circuit involves uh, basically uh, reversing this whole circuit uh, to get back to uh, get as close as possible to the channel states again and perform a bunch of operations again, uh, again governed by, I mean, dictated by this belief propagation with quantum messages to infer the values of the rest of the qubits. And uh, here we had to perform an additional uh, conditional rotation uh, in the reversal uh, part of the belief propagation circuit, uh, which was not in, which was missing in uh, Renes's prescription. So there's something we had to add. And so when you perform this full circuit, and you look at the results for this example code, uh, we find that the minimum average error probability of decoding these eight code words with uh, the BPQM receiver exactly attains uh, the quantum optimal Hellstrom limit of uh, discriminating these eight code words. So this is the quantum fundamental limit. And uh, so we are at the quantum limit and uh, in contrast, if you were to perform symbol by symbol detection followed by classical uh, um, maximum likelihood uh, uh, decoding, you are you are then uh, restricted to the uh, the red and the blue code word, uh, the blue uh, curves here. So the, the red curve is with uh, classical belief propagation after you know performing individual uh, bit uh, measurements. And uh, the blue is where, where you perform uh, code word uh, maximum likelihood block error, uh, block decoding. Okay, so so we are at the quantum limit for the average error probability, and also we see that uh, if you per, if you compute uh, this measure known as the photon information efficiency, which is uh, essentially uh, the mutual information that you can get between the uh, transmitter and the receiver per use of the channel uh, divided by the number of photons in your pulses. And this, this is a figure of merit that is very relevant in the quantum limited regime of, uh, you know, for example, deep space communications. Mm -hmm. There, uh, even with this small example, five bit code, if you compare the photon information efficiency with the uh, symbol by symbol re receiver, detection receiver, the optimal symbol by symbol detection receiver, that's the black line. Whereas with our joint detection receiver based on BPQM, we get this uh, uh, these blue dots, which match the quantum optimal uh, uh, the photon inf photon information efficiency with the quantum optimal uh, scheme, uh, uh, basically with the Hellstrom measurement for uh, these eight code words for this five bit code. And so this is an, a, a, a phenomenon that's known as super additive capacity because we exceed, uh, I mean, you cannot attain this uh, capacity without performing this joint detection. So if you were to limit yourself to symbol by symbol detection, then no matter how much post-processing you do classically, you cannot uh, you know, go past this uh, black curve, but whereas here with our joint detection receiver, we can. And with larger codes, with better codes, uh, potentially with such a, a joint detection scheme, we, we can go all the way to this uh, red line, which is the photon information efficiency uh, associated with the optimal, uh, I mean, which is the optimal photon information efficiency for this BPSK modulation uh, uh, known as the, the Holevo capacities. Uh, it's the photon information efficiency of the Holevo capacity of BPSK. Okay, so, uh, so, that, so that was the theory part of our, uh, uh, work and now uh, I will talk about a trap down realization of this belief propagation uh, uh, decoder receiver. Uh, so what we uh, did was uh, so we basically have so think of this uh, like you have a, a way to transduce information from the optical pulses received uh, from your uh, deep space communication channel 
somehow uh, on to uh, the trap dion domain and then you can perform this joint detection receiver which is a which is a structured quantum circuit uh, in terms of c naught gates and uh, other uh, other uh, single qubit gates as shown in the previous slide then we can basically uh, you know have this uh, joint detection receiver realized in a trap dion quantum computer and so uh, we give a theoretical uh, transduction mechanism for this one possibility and then we uh, have an experimental realization of the circuit on the honeywell's trap dion processor so that's coming next so the mechanism is uh, basically uh, uh, a jane's cummins type uh, hamiltonian a time dependent interaction uh, between your incoming laser light pulses and uh, ytterbium ions in a in a trap and uh, let's say the ions are initiated in their ground states and the incoming laser pulse are either in i mean are in one of these uh, two possible bpsk coherent states then uh, after they interact with a uh, this jane uh, stem i mean after they interact with the uh, ions in the trap if you perform photon number detection then we show that it is possible to you know uh, to perform this transduction in a heralded fashion uh, and the probability of uh, transduction is uh, is is re is really close to one when you are uh, i mean you can you can have the probability of transduction really close to one when your photon pulses are extremely feeble and uh, we can tune the uh, time dependent coupling to uh, make sure to to have the uh, inner product between the coherent states plus beta and minus beta mapped in a preserved fashion to the qubit states in the ions but even we can even do better and we can uh, we can try to optimize uh, like uh, the 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 error probability of discriminating the the ionic states after this transduction but uh, if you look at the total probability of uh, you know successful transduction followed by successful discrimination then of course it cannot exceed the minimum error probability of discriminating the the optical pulses you know before transduction and we see that uh, you know that law preserved here which is so the uh, rehelstrom limit of discriminating the plus beta minus beta states is this blue curve and uh, the post selected uh, i mean so the inner product preserving uh, uh, interaction uh, after you have, i mean successful i mean the, the overall success probability of discrimination which consists of su successful transduction followed by discrimination is this blue curve the light blue curve but then you can do better by post selecting with a larger number of clicks and uh, optimizing the uh, total average error probability of discrimination okay and so uh, in our uh, experiment we we stick to the inner product preserving transduction and what we did was we took this uh, even smaller code a three bit code with just one parity check condition so this uh, the this is the code there are only four, there are four code words that satisfy basically x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 0 and uh, this is the Uh, corresponding belief propagation requirement message circuit and if you were to perform this transduction mechanism from the previous slide and assume we can do this ideally uh, then you can apply this circuit on the ions in the trap and uh, so we did that using uh, uh, honeywell's uh, processor and here are the results so if you were to just look at the look at decoding the value of the first bit then this is these are the results so the the different uh, curves here so i would like to uh, draw your attention to the the magenta pop, magenta uh, points which are the 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 performance with the belief propagation the ppqm algorithm in a simulation and uh, in an actual in the actual experiment uh, we see the gray gray points and there are error bars associated but they're pretty uh, uh, small error bars so these data points were gathered from 1000 runs uh, per shot uh, sorry 1000 shots per data point here basically so an averaging over 1000 shots and uh, the so 
so the purple curves the purple curve is the the quantum optimal uh, performance and for the first bit and uh, what we see in the experiment is uh, close to that and it 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 actually exceeds the classical uh, limit which is if you were to perform a direct uh, uh, detect direct uh, pulse detection of each pulse followed by you know classical uh, you know maximum likelihood uh, code word uh, block co block uh, maximum likelihood detection or something so there is a you can exceed the performance with the classical uh, of the classical mode you can go beyond the classical mode and here are the results for the total circuit and to decode the total code words and here of course we we are still severely fidelity limited uh, so one has to perform a total of uh, so we optimized this circuit in the uh, the, the, the gate set the native gate set of this processor uh, the Honeywell processor and it, it it comes up to uh, about 80 c naught gates 80 2 qubit gates uh, in its native set and uh, uh, we see that the the black points here are the bpqm um, uh, full code word uh, error probability after uh, the actual processor run and uh, I think there is one point here uh, at very low mean photon numbers where we are slightly below uh, the classical limit, but there is still a significant error bar there. So uh, we are still very se severely fidelity limited at the moment. But uh, uh, I think uh, there is there's a lot of uh, prospect towards you know improving this uh, and actually seeing a quantum advantage. Uh, with these uh, these tap ion processors in a, so such hybrid schemes can uh, potentially be uh, already used in, uh, in building such a receiver and uh, we also show that uh, if you were to use such a, a hybrid receiver on larger codes uh, so this is not experimental plot but this is a projection if you were to be able to use such a receiver for a larger, say, Holeo capacity achieving, I mean, uh, a capacity achieving code, then uh, we can uh, reap up to a factor of five improvement in data rates at uh, these very low mean photon numbers. Uh, the, these two points, the red and the yellow, they actually correspond to mean photon numbers with uh, uh, at Mars distances for standard optical, uh, you know, transmit power if you were to have a transmitter on a spacecraft. Uh, so we, we use the, the, uh, the specs from uh, JPL, NASA's, uh, okay, actually the, the Lincoln Labs lunar laser, laser con demonstration from 2013. So we use those uh, equipment num uh, specs to come up with these uh, projections and we have, we can show up to about uh, five times improvement in the rate if you were to use these capacity achieving codes. Okay, and so just uh, to, wind, uh, to wind up this talk, uh, so I'd like to mention that to go towards a hybrid scheme is a potential uh, for a direction, but it's also uh, very, uh, very, it is, it would be very nice to have an all optical realization of this receiver. And this should be possible if we could implement cat basis quantum logic, because uh, for these BPSK coherent states, the the minimum, the the Hellstrom measurement uh, uh, is actually a projection onto the cat basis, and uh, these BPSK coherent states live in the the qubit space that is defined by these cat states, uh, Schrodinger cat states. So if we uh, could have like a full set of uh, a gate set uh, uh, to perform universal operations, we could uh, potentially implement our uh, receiver design on a photonic uh, chip. And here are uh, the, the here is an example of a gate set using cat states. Uh, I mean that can implement cat basis logic. It requires ancilla cat states, and this is, can be found in a paper by Ralph and all from early two thousands. Okay, so uh, uh, things that could be interesting to look at are uh, designing BP, BPQM code uh, BPQM based receivers for larger tree codes. We've currently just seen this five bit example. Uh, and also beyond tree codes, because uh, tree codes are very a restrictive class of uh, codes with not great uh, properties in terms of distance and rates. So it would be nice to go beyond tree, tree codes. 
And then uh, it's also interesting to think of uh, receivers based on this BPQM for more general channel models. Here, so far, we've assumed that you know every uh, bit is like going through the same. I mean, so we have an IID model for the channel, the same kind of uh, loss. Uh, but you could have a more general channel where the the loss parameters are you know different from every shot, uh, and also going beyond pure loss channel. And also, it's in, it would be interesting to consider uh, you know such CQ channel coding and decoding for uh, quantum key distribution, for example, and uh, also for uh, entanglement assisted classical communications. Okay, so to summarize, I, I spoke about uh, uh, our blueprint of a quantum circuit that implements a BPQM based joint detection receiver for an example five bit code. And we elucidated the performance gap in decoding error probability and the photon information efficiency between using this joint detection receiver versus not using. And uh, the, uh, we, we finally sh showed some results uh, from the trap down realization of this receiver for a three bit tree code. And it remains an open problem to design BPQM based uh, receivers for uh, beyond tree codes and uh, larger codes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I went over time still. After. Oh, that's all right. Um, thanks for a lovely talk. And I, I can say that I think Dowling would have been proud to see you using James Cummings for a transduction. I can say that definitively. Um, I wrote down a number of questions, but if other people have questions, um, please, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Yeah, one, one for me is the photo detector efficiency is assumed to be one all the way. Uh, that's right. Yeah, we, we assume we have ideal photo detectors. Yeah, actually, one can uh, also include that as part of the transmissivity of the channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we haven't considered a, a separate mm -hmm. transmissivities for the detectors. Yeah. Yeah, but effectively, if you have many detectors, that that accumulates. And that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good. That's a that's that's a correct point. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, I'll ask mine. Um, so what is the precise claim of quantum advantage um, in your work? Because if you go back to slide 20, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's hard to see the quantum advantage, right? That's true. So the experimental results didn't turn out as uh, as expected. Like in a sense, like we are still severely. Uh, I think there's uh, too much noise in the processor, just or like not sufficient, uh, sufficiently low noise for us to uh, to show this uh, quantum advantage at you know reasonable photon numbers. Right now, uh, we are banking on this one point mm -hmm. where. It seems to be below the classical limit, uh, okay. but it is still within an error bar. So, uh, all right, but but um, a bit of wishy washy right now. Yeah, if like Professor Lee said, you take into account all the you know a full system. Um, does this data point reflect like an actual system in practice um, obtaining? A quantum advantage experimentally? Uh, no, it doesn't. So I should make, I should uh, clarify again that we did not perform this transduction in experiment. So we just okay. gave this theoretical mechanism and say that it is possible in principle to implement it, but we haven't done it. We assume that we can ideally tra uh, transduce from the optical retard beyond the main and then. Uh, here is the receiver. Here is the circuit that needs to be implemented in the trap down domain in order to realize this receiver. And so we just experimentally test that part of the receiver alone. Okay. So, so just to be clear, um, 
you prepare the ion qubits in these plus or minus theta, and then you try to decode, and then this plot reflects that. Is that right? That's correct, cool. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a whole other list of questions. Oh, something funny is you said, uh, this is just a comment. You said quantum generalized, but usually we just say quantized. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, it's like a minor point. Um, okay, so I had a question actually about slide nine. Mm -hmm. Thanks, very nice. Um, yeah, I thought it was interesting. I didn't realize that um, the Hellstrom measurement was always Pauli X. That's that's correct. So like you, you always measure the Pauli x observable to distinguish theta from minus theta. That's correct. Yes, it's it is always Pauli x that's for correct. the by BPSK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I I thought that was very interesting. Um, okay, then on slide twelve, mm -hmm. you remarked that um, you, you were talking about terminology belief propagation of quantum messages versus quantum belief propagation. Can you describe what people actually mean by the term quantum belief propagation? Yes. So what I've seen is, um, I think uh, David, Pul David Pullen uh, from Sherbrooke. Uh, yeah, former, and Matt Leifer, right? He, he spoke about uh, using classical belief propagation in uh, decoding stabilizer codes. And so, uh, you would, if you were to decode a quantum stabilizer code, uh, you perform these syndrome measurements and you can apply a classical belief propagation algorithm to, to you know, de decode those syndromes. I mean, to use those syndromes to, uh, uh, you know, for stabilizer code decoding, basically. Yeah. And so in that sense, uh, people have already, okay, so people have already used this term quantum belief propagation to refer to actual classical belief propagation over syndrome measurement occurs. And so we wanted to distinguish it from this from that because here we are actually doing something different. Uh, just, just what Joe has pr proposed is something else, right? Which is sending quantum messages. Okay. But I think the same David Poulin in a separate paper with Matt Leifer had something about um, fully quantum belief propagation. There's a very long paper that they wrote together back in like 2007 or 2008. Do you know what I'm talking about? We don't actually. No. Oh, you don't? Okay. You should have a look at that. Um, I, I bet that it would be in Renez's um, reference list in his paper. I see. Um, part of it of this paper, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, my my final question is, you know, I did this work with Saikat about decoding um, classical information uh, using quantum polar codes, using polar codes over quantum channels, and then both with Saikat and Joe, uh, we we together generalize these schemes to decoding quantum information. And it's kind of like you, you run the decoder in superposition. You know, you like, you, you decode the classical bits coherently. Mm -hmm. And with Joe, we showed that you, you do it twice. And so um, the thing is in your implementation, you're, you're already doing things quite coherently, right? Mm -hmm. And so have you thought about generalizing your scheme to decoding quantum data? So to use quantum belief propagation to, sorry, belief propagation of quantum messages to decode quantum polar codes. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, we haven't thought about that. I haven't at least. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's something we could we could talk about if, if you want, you know, I think it's interesting. Yes. interesting. I think you've already done a significant amount of steps uh, towards that. And I believe in Joe's paper, um, he showed, I think, I, I might have it wrong, but I think maybe for the amplitude damping channel, which is kind of like a pure loss channel, that, mm -hmm. that you, can, you can decode quantum data efficiently 
um, that's encoded in polar codes. Mm. That might be an interesting next step. That's true. Yeah, I, I recall reading that in this paper. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. 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 Some maybe something we can think about and discuss. Okay. I'm gonna hit stop record now, unless other people have questions. Does anyone else have questions? All right. Well, uh, let's thank Kashik again. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was an excellent talk. All right. So I'm gonna hit stop record now. Um, maybe I have a couple of questions to.